This is the Thoughts from a Page podcast, where I interview authors about their latest works. Listen to what inspired the storyline, how their covers and titles were chosen, their personal connection to the story, and other fascinating tidbits about the authors themselves. My name is Cindy Burnett, and I love to talk about books. I can be found on Instagram and Pinterest at Thoughts from a Page. And if you have any comments about the podcast or feedback for me, I can be reached through my website, www.thoughtsfromapage.com. Today, I am interviewing Fiona Davis and MJ Rose about stories from Suffragette City, a collection of short stories about the suffragette movement by 13 of today's best-selling authors. Fiona began her career in New York City as an actress, where she worked on Broadway, off-Broadway, and in regional theater. After getting a master's degree at Columbia Journalism School, she fell in love with writing, leapfrogging from editor to freelance journalist before finally settling down as an author of historical fiction. She's a graduate of the College of William & Mary and is based in New York City. MJ grew up in New York City exploring the galleries of the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the dark tunnels and lush gardens of Central Park. She is the author of more than a dozen novels, the founder of the first marketing company for authors, authorbuzz.com, and co-founder of 1001darknights.com. She lives in Connecticut. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you enjoy the show. Welcome, Fiona and MJ. I'm really glad you are here to speak with me about stories from Suffragette City. How are you both? Fine, thank you. Doing very well. Thanks for having us. Well, why don't we get started by you guys telling me a little bit about the book? Sure. So Stories from Suffragette City, it's a collection of short stories, and they all take place on October 23rd in 1915. And that was a really important day in the women's suffrage movement when thousands of women paraded up Fifth Avenue to fight for their right to vote, which they did not have at that point. And so what we did is we reached out to a number of amazing authors and asked them to each write a story from a character's point of view. And then pulled them all together and created this wonderful anthology called Stories from Suffragette City. Where did you get the initial inspiration for the project? We got the inspiration for this project because Fiona and I went to an event in Minneapolis hosted by Pamela Klingerhorn. And when we were leaving, we got stuck at the airport. We started talking about the idea of doing an anthology. I had started off by telling Fiona about a friend of mine named Meredith Bergman, who had just been chosen, she's a sculptress, to do the first sculpture in Central Park of living women. So she had been hired to do a suffrage sculpture. And I was telling Fiona about it. It was all very quick because by the time we got on the plane, we were starting to take notes, sitting in separate seats with our internet connections on. We started researching, sending each other messages, got off the plane. And while we were walking to baggage, Fiona came up with the title of Suffragette City. And then we immediately started going after the authors. We had a very long list of fabulous authors who would be great for the anthology. We had about 50 of them, but we never even got to them because everybody who we asked said yes right away. That's fabulous. So you just kind of made a list and then started working your way down and everybody wanted to participate. Yeah, it was really very moving and surprising because they're very busy, very successful authors who have a million things to do. And they all were just so enchanted by the idea and felt it was so important that they all said yes. And then how did you go about weaving the stories together? I mean, they are all separate stories, but there is some interweaving. So how did that come about? So as we were talking, we thought, well, wouldn't it be interesting to have some common thread that links them? Because we knew every story would be completely different. And they really are. You have, from the point of view of the Men's League for Women's Suffrage, from a Chinese immigrant, from an Irish immigrant, you have just so many different points of view. And we said, well, what if there's a missing girl, like a little girl who goes missing early on in the stories and appears in each one, in not all of them, but in certain of them and then is kind of reunited with her family at the last story. And we just thought that would be an interesting way to keep the tension going as people are reading, just wondering what's happening to Grace the Little Girl. And how did you decide who would write about what? I mean, did you just give everybody carte blanche and then kind of make sure there wasn't an overlap or how did that part work? 
Yeah, that was pretty much exactly what it was. Fiona and I did a, a research document where we included a lot of articles from the New York Times and other city papers from the era. And we invited everybody to tell a story about either a real person who might have marched or a fictional character that they wanted to make up that would march. Then we asked each author to give us an idea of what they wanted to do to make sure that there were no overlaps and there were none. And interestingly, it was a very good mix of people who chose to write about real people versus authors who made up people entirely. So really, we didn't have to ask anybody to change what they were doing at all. Everything fit. That's pretty amazing. This whole project has been amazing. <laughs> I mean, to truly think that you didn't have to have anyone alter what they were doing at all. You just sort of gave them this basic idea and everybody came back with something ready to go. That That's pretty impressive. And it's a wide range, which is really nice too, a, a, a diverse group of individuals. We love that there's men, there's women. And so you have an Armenian point of view, you have rich, you have poor. So we wanted to have a wide variety of characters populate the stories. And, and it just naturally happened because... The caliber of these authors is, is so good. They they knew what's their strong point and they attacked it from that angle. No, I agree. And that's exactly what I liked about it was that it was a bunch of different stories about the same event, but from so many different perspectives. Yeah. Fiona and I are the only people that wrote about rich people. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I enjoyed both of those character <laughs> stories. So it's a nice perspective all the way across. Well, what was the process like for finding a publisher for it? It was really kind of just like the idea. It just kind of all bubbled up and, and worked out really well. Once we had the idea and the document ready, we went to our agents and they both jumped on it and said, yes, this is fantastic. And then once we had all the authors lined up, our agents went out to editors and we did a lot of phone calls with publishing houses and they pitched what they thought. It was kind of wonderful to be on the receiving end of that. And then ended up at Flatiron, which moved over to Holt in the process of it. And with James Malia, it was just a perfect fit, enthusiastic right from the very start. There's a funny thing about that that I didn't even realize until last week. A friend of mine who's an author just sent a book out on submission and asked me how long it takes for a book from when it's submitted. And I didn't remember. So I looked this up because this is the last book I was involved in selling. And I was about, I was telling her it's usually three weeks or four weeks. I was shocked. Fiona, I don't know if you even remember this. No, I don't. It was seven days that we got the first offer. It was one week. And again, that speaks to the quality of these authors. For a week is like shocking. It was amazing. <laughs> that is amazing. But also I think it's a relevant project for everything that the country is going through right now. And there's not a lot out there like this. You're not stepping into vampire field where there's a thousand <laughs> books or whatever. I mean, you're writing something different and compiling something different that people are going to really want to read about. Yeah. And it was really interesting too, because I remember when James told us how much they wanted this book, one of the reasons was, and it was such an interesting and smart reason, everybody was afraid of what they were going to publish around the election because everybody knew it would be so hard to get readers to buy books when everybody, all anybody was thinking about was the vote. And the editors and the publishers at Halt had felt that if they could publish anything during that time period, it would be this. This was the only book they wanted to come out with during that like four week period because it was so apropos. Well, I think that is definitely correct. And that is something that I, I just haven't been involved with this part of the process for long enough to realize that they really do put a hold from almost mid-October to mid-December on many books coming out because of the election. So yes, I think that's exactly right. But this is the perfect book for that time period. And also the fact that it's the 100th anniversary of women getting the right to vote. The timing just couldn't be better. It, it really was just sublime. I agree completely. So we talked about the title, but we didn't talk about the cover. Tell me about that. Yeah. So the cover, we had lots of ideas and we eventually settled on this one. At first we thought, oh, it's yellow. Is that quite right? But I think it really stands out from the other books that are out that are dealing with the suffragette movement. And we wanted to make sure it read as a fictional group of stories, not nonfiction. And again, there's a lot out there. Well, and this may be a silly question, but is there a significance for the yellow for the suffragette movement or was it just a color that stood out and was bright? Yeah, the suffragette colors are white, purple and a green. 
That's what so, I thought. Okay. Yeah. It was like, I don't <laughs> think they are, but maybe I've missed something. No, so that's and, why and I'm asking. We actually wanted it to be those colors originally, but yellow is the most like of any color that's going to pop in a book cover. Yellow is the number one color. A lot of people don't use it because it's a really hard color to use. There's so many shades of yellow that are a little off, but it happens to be the, the most poppable color. So I think that they really chose it for its poppability. Is that a word? <laughs> I like that. <laughs> now it is. <laughs> well, and it's unique. And I, I do think I'm all about book covers, as Fiona knows. I love them. And that's sort of usually what catches my eye about a book to get started with it. And I think the yellow is unique and it will definitely be eye-catching. Yes. Well, are either one of you working on anything at the present that you would like to share with me? Oh, my book is coming out in February and it's called The Last Tiara. And I've been writing for the last couple of years, the way Fiona has building that she centers her stories around. I've been centering my stories around a piece of jewelry. And this one is centered around a Fabergé tiara that existed in Russia that we have photographs of that go back to 1921, but in 1922 or 1923, it went missing. And it has never been seen again. It's incredibly valuable. And my story takes place in 1948 when a young woman finds the tiara behind a wall in her mother's bedroom. Her mother's died and left her her apartment. And the story is told in two timelines, the mother's story in Russia in 1917 and how she came to own the tiara and the daughter's story about finding it and discovering what it is. There's some mystery and there's some love and there's some history and hopefully people will be intrigued by it. Oh, that sounds fantastic. And they don't have any idea in real life what happened to it? No, there's a very, I could tell you, but it'll take up too much time. The history of how they know it existed and when it went missing and stuff like that. But they, nobody has any idea. It's one of only two pieces of jewelry that they know of that were part of the Romanov hoard that the Bolsheviks tried to sell. It's a, one of only two pieces that are missing. So it's probably squirreled away in someone's vault <laughs> and they just don't want it ever to see the light of day so they don't have to turn it back in. Probably. Oh, that sounds very good. And I think I saw the cover the other day and it's really pretty too. And I loved your last book. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Fiona, what about you? I know we've talked a little bit about it, but do you want to talk a little bit about your next book? Sure. So the book is set at the Frick Collection, which is a beautiful Gilded Age mansion on Fifth Avenue. That was the home of Henry Clay Frick and his family. And it has two timelines like MJ's. So it's 1919 and 1966. Most of it's from the point of view of a private secretary to one of the Frick family members. And we'll see how it goes. It's draft form right now, but, but working away. And is the Frick still closed? It's being renovated. Is that right? It's being renovated. It is closed and the renovations won't be done until 2023, unfortunately. But they are moving the collection to a nearby museum. And so you will be able to go and, and see things. It's one of my favorite museums in New York. <laughs> oh, it's one of my favorites too. When Fiona first told me that, I think I gasped because I'm like, oh, that's one of my favorite <laughs> places in New York City to visit. It's such a great museum. So I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, there's a lot to play with in there. It's fun. Well, back to stories from Suffragette City. What surprised you most about the project? I think for me, what surprised me is sort of what I said before, how fast it all went once, once we sat down in that airport and how seamless it was in terms of Fiona and I working together. I was so excited when she wanted to work on it. And then we got along so well and we all got along so well. It's been like really lovely. It's so true. And I think what surprised me was I'm fairly new to the book world. I've got published about five years ago, but MJ's been been writing books and been involved in marketing and, and been behind the scenes for a while. And so what surprised me was when she came up with this dream list of authors, and these include Paula McLean, Steve Berry, uh, Lisa Wingate, Christina Baker Klein, Jamie Ford, the, and Chris Bojalian, like the list goes on and on. And I thought, hmm, we'll see. And because of her contacts and because she knows everyone, <laughs> They were, she reached out and they replied to her immediately. And to me, that was incredible. Certainly if it were me reaching out, it would not have had that same reaction. So I was very impressed. Well, it is quite a <laughs> powerful group of, of writers. 
And they've done such a lovely job with their stories. It's so interesting to read the book and read the stories and see how each author has their own sensibility and they really, truly bring it to the story. I mean, thinking especially of Steve Barry now, where, I mean, he's really a thriller writer who writes, who has a very historical aspect to his books. And he managed to include a thriller aspect to his story. It's the only one in the book that has a, basically a ticking a ticking bomb, literally. And it's so interesting to see that. And, and somebody like Paula McLean, whose story has so much poetry to it. And that's been so fascinating to see them each take the same idea and how totally differently they present it. It's true. And just to, I want to make sure we mention everybody. So no yes, one gets Yes, read the out. list. Yeah. So Lisa <laughs> Wingate, MJ Rose, Steve Berry, Paula McLean, Catherine J. Chen, Christina Baker Klein, Jamie Ford, Dolan Perkins Valdez, Megan Chance, Allison Richman, Chris Bojalian, Fiona Davis, and an introduction by Kristen Hanna. I mean, that is quite a list. It was just wonderful. It was just so interesting as an author to research and create my own story and be part of the process of creating this larger selection of stories. It was it was really, really fun. Did you find it, was it different to be an editor versus a writer, Fiona? Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Because we made it clear early on that we didn't want to edit these stories So our editor at Holt did that because these are top notch authors. We didn't want to say, you know, I think this word would be better (laughs) because (laughs) for sure. However, so the editor term is really just for the person behind the scenes, making sure people are meeting deadlines, making sure everyone has all the information they need, keeping them inspired. And that was just so much fun. And as the story started coming in, it was just the most exciting thing to see what was, what was next. How did you decide to order the stories? We really didn't do that. Our editor did that. We left that up to him. That's always in an anthology, such an incredibly difficult and fraught issue because somebody's going to get upset. There's no no way around it. Somebody's going to think their story should be first or is jealous of whose story is first. So he ordered the stories and I never asked him like what his reasoning was other than the fact that my story had to go fairly early because I was introducing the little girl who gets lost. And we always knew Fiona's story would be at the end because she was going to have the little girl found and returned to her guardian. So other than those two little things, it was completely up to James. The first time I read it, I didn't really think about that. I just read the stories and enjoyed them. And as I was reviewing it yesterday before we talked, it just kind of made me wonder. I thought, I wonder, obviously, the two you mentioned where you've got to start at the beginning with grace and end with grace. But I wondered in between if there was a rhyme or reason or if it just happened to be the way they flowed. I I think James really kind of was able to take stories that are very different. So Steve Barry's story is very different from Paula McLean's and Um, Dolan Perkins Valdez's is very different from Megan Chance's. And so you're really taking on a a roller coaster of a ride. And I think he did a great job of setting that up. It's almost like when you put together a music album and you've got your slow song and your fast song (laughs) and then your slower song again. (laughs) So it's the same idea, I guess, with the anthology, because you do want to mix it up. You don't want all your really fast paced stories together and the slower ones are more character driven on the end. So that, that makes sense. Exactly. Well, before we wrap up, I would love to hear what you both have been reading lately that you would recommend. Sure, I'll go first. Um, I I loved The Exiles by Christina Baker Klein, who is one of our authors. And and it's a book that's set in Australia and England in the 1800s. And it's really about women's voices and women's agency. So again, it's quite related to stories from Suffragette City in many ways. And then I just want to mention a book that I found really helpful in my research. And I think readers, if they like stories from Suffragette City and they want to dig further, is to check out Gilded Suffragists by Joanna Newman, which is a wonderful book that helped me as I created the story that was centered around Alva Vanderbilt Belmont and is just a really fun read. I'm going to have to quick come up with another title because that was one of the books that I was going to mention. (laughs) That's okay. Because it so helped us. It helped all of us. Fiona and I had read it. It was really inspirational. But I have two others I can do. Megan Chance has a book coming out January 1st that I just finished reading in ARC, which is called The Splendid Ruin. As one of our writers, I was especially interested to read it. And it's a Gilded Age novel, so it fit right into the time and the place of what she wrote about for us and one of my favorite time periods. Really a terrific book. 
Somebody we didn't include is Beatrice Williams. She was on our list, but it was alphabetical and we we never got there. But she has wonderful books and she writes a series uh, called the Windy City series. And I hadn't read those. And I just discovered the first one. And it's a prohibition, takes place during prohibition. And it's really fabulous. So I'll do those two and give a a second to the, the book that Fiona talked about. She does. I really like that series that you mentioned. And I'm going to have to look for Megan Chance's book because I I love that time period. Oh, yeah, you'll love it. She's a really terrific writer that not as many people have discovered as they should. She's got some other books that if you like that, some of her older books are really evocative. And we were a little bit sometimes in the same world where she has a tendency to do a little, little paranormal, little bit of magic. So very good writer. Well, thank you both so much for joining me today. It's been a delight to talk with you about stories from Suffragette City, and I can't wait for it to get out to everyone else. And thank thank you you for for interviewing us. Yes, thank you. It was so wonderful. Thank you so much for listening to my podcast. If you like this episode, and I hope you did, please follow me on Instagram at Thoughts From A Page. Tell all of your friends about the podcast and rate it wherever you listen to your podcasts. I would really appreciate it. Stories from Suffragette City can be purchased at Murder by the Book, where I work part-time, and the link is in the show notes. Thanks so much to KP Regan for the sound editing, and I hope to see you next time. History is complicated. The story of human progress is long, messy, and riddled with controversies big and small. On Conflicted, we dive headfirst into history's most infamous events and contentious figures. We try and untangle the good from the bad, the facts from the fiction, and the monsters from the misunderstood. Was Genghis Khan a murderous butcher or a civic pioneer? Did the Allied powers go too far in firebombing the German city of Dresden at the twilight of World War II? And how did the Marquis de Sade acquire such a sinister reputation? And was any of it true? These are just a few of the tough questions we wrestle with and investigate on Conflicted. So if you love history or just enjoy a good story, please join me, your host, Zach Cornwell, for a fascinating new topic each and every month. Conflicted, a history podcast, is available on Spotify, Apple, or wherever else you get your podcasts. I hope to see you soon.